Hello, everyone. I am here with 2020 congressional candidate from Nebraska's second congressional district, Kara Eastman, fresh off of her primary victory. She's here to talk about what she did to be successful and how we can help her win and defeat Republican incumbent Don Bacon in November. Kara, thank you so much for coming on the program. Thank you for having me. I'm, I'm so honored to be here. You know, I, I was telling Kara before we came on that her success here really helped to kind of pull me out of this funk that I was feeling, um, you know, because it, it seems like everything that we worked for in a way was crashing and burning before our very eyes. And, you know, there's still a number of really fantastic members, uh, congressional candidates running for Congress across the country. And your victory meant so much because it showed us that, you know, we can still win. We still have a lot to fight for. And this election isn't over. Like we may have not been successful at the top of the ticket, but we can still really have a tremendous impact, you know, when it comes to congressional races across the country. Um, So I just want to ask you, because this is really a difficult question that we're all asking to our selves. How did you win? Like, what do you think you you did? What were the key ingredients to your campaign success? Because you're running in Nebraska and, you know, conventional wisdom would tell us that you have to be kind of centrist and you, you can't be too bold. But you've run on this really bold, unapologetically progressive campaign. Your advocacy for single payer is just phenomenal. The way that you explain it, I think, is perfect. Um, So what do you think made you successful? Well, I mean, part of it is just hard work. We we were able to, you know, in 2018, we knocked on about 200,000 doors. This cycle, we made a full pass of the district before the coronavirus hit. I think my field director today said we had about 320,000 attempts at voter contact, either at the doors or by phone. And so I think hard work is part of it. But, but the other piece is, you know, I am fortunate enough to have run in 2018. So I do my name ID is relatively high in the district. I think that helps. But also, I think people are looking for authenticity in a candidate. And even though we don't always agree on everything, at least people know who I am and what I stand for and where I stand on things. And, and I think now it's just a matter of candidates trying to get people to understand that while not everybody agrees on progressive issues, there, there's there's so much common ground. And I think part of the problem is is like messaging, it's it's buzzwords that throw people off. We learned this, right, from Obamacare, Affordable Care Act, people didn't know they were different things or they thought they were different things. And and so I think that's how it's happening now. Like you walk into a room and say Medicare for all and half the room shuts down because they're like, oh, I don't like that thing that that guy was talking about on TV for <laughs> years. Um, and so, but the reality is when you explain it to them, when you say this is cheaper for the federal government, this is a lot cheaper for you. This means you actually have choice and freedom when it comes to health care, that you, you don't have to go with in network, out of network for no apparent reason whatsoever, that you're not going to get hit with surprise billing. I think then people start going, huh, that's really interesting. Then you get a pandemic and you and people say, wow, untethering health care from employment. Not so crazy. Yeah. And when I saw um, or when I when I posted the video of your single payer, um, uh, basically, you, ma you make the case for single payer and you kind of respond to all of these talking points that we've seen that have largely, you know, um, manifested from within the industry that are fed to politicians. Um, you broke down all of these anti-Medicare for all talking points, I think, brilliantly. And one thing that I, I noted when I talked about that was that you really you have a great way of explaining something to where you meet people where they are. So understanding, you know, the context of the district that, you know, that you're running in and all of that unique dynamics there, you know, you, you, you touch on these aspects of freedom, which is important to people. You know, you will be more free under a Medicare for all system. And what's interesting is that the minute you won, your opponent, Don Bacon, Republican, uh, immediately started lambasting you on Twitter with this absurd Twitter thread going through all of the ways that you are kind of this cuckoo crazy person and he's really trying to frame you as someone who is an unrealistic candidate and what is going to be your response because he already is trying to really focus on single payer and he's trying to use that to bring you down how are you going to basically um repel some of these attacks and what do you think will be the best strategy going forward to actually beat him because I think this is a very winnable race and it's going to be difficult. But if you win, this could really change discourse nationally when it comes to where progressives can and can't win. So how are you going to beat this guy? Good question. Um, well, well, first of all, we're lucky, right? This playbook has been played for decades about 
Democrats about ideas, Medicare, that this was the same narrative, Social Security, same narrative, that this is crazy pie in the sky idea. Um, and so, so there's that, right? There's the, the fact that this is, this is a traditional playbook that they bring out to try to make someone look nuts when really what we're saying is like, there's a better system out there that actually saves money. And, and, and obviously when, when there's a woman running the, the narrative, they love, you know, they love this narrative. Like I'm, I'm this radical socialist, crazy person um, that I don't have the right temperament, all these kinds of things. Well, like I, I've run nonprofit organizations for over 20 years. My temperament's pretty calm, pretty cool. And I've gotten things done that people said couldn't get done. And that's by building coalitions, by bringing people together. So I think one, we have, we have an obligation to point out where, his, his playbook is the Republican playbook. It's the Trump playbook. And, and he's just regurgitating speaking points given to him by a party. I've never been that person, nor will I ever be. Because I am going to fight for the things I believe in. And any party can tell me what they think I should say. But, you know, I'm just going to be me. And, and the other part of this is the reality is Congressman Bacon has voted three times to take away health care from people without a viable plan to replace it. When he talks about his plan, which was had some made up name, th there's no way that that's going to save money. And and I can't believe that a, that somebody, you know, where the Republican Party has traditionally been this party of fiscal responsibility, they're now completely rejecting, although not completely. Right. Because when we look at single payer, it keeps growing among you know popularity among Republicans. But they, they're, they're, some of them are rejecting this idea that we could have a system that's much more efficient, that eliminates waste, and that saves money for people. I don't quite understand why that would be unpopular. Oh, wait, yes, I do. When the pharmaceutical companies and the insurance companies are coming in and lobbying and paying for politicians to say this crap, it works. And so now it's time for us to stand up against those things and say, we're going to elect politicians who don't take corporate PAC money, who aren't bought and sold by industry and by special interests and who are actually going to fight for regular working. And frankly, right now, people who aren't working yeah. in this country, because this is what we need and what we deserve. Yeah. And the irony is that he accused you in his Twitter thread of wanting to, quote unquote, take away people's health care. But that's what he voted to do three times, because if you just want to repeal what we have in place, Ob Obamacare, it wasn't perfect, but it it's better than nothing. But if you repeal that and you don't have a replacement plan, that's quite literally taking away health care. So there's this weird conflict with their talking points. On one hand, proponents of single payer want to take away health care, but at the same time, it's too expensive and we can't afford it. Well, which one is it? If we're taking it away, then... There's nothing there to pay for, right? So, you know, and these talking points don't make sense because they're meant to really confuse people. And at a time when we have whistleblowers like Wendell Powder, who came from the industry, who says, hey, I helped write this choice talking point that politicians are now using. I think there's really nowhere to hide. And I wanted to ask you, because you've talked to so many people, what is the reception when you talk to people who don't necessarily know about Medicare for All and might not necessarily be dispositioned to support a progressive what is the response when you explain it to them? Because I think the way that you explain it, it's basically you can't explain it in a better way. You break it down in such a phenomenal way. That's why I shared that video rather than your actual campaign ad when I talked about your victory, because it's such a great way. Because part of what I think has been missing with progressives is we're great at talking about policy, but marketing is, is difficult. Marketing in the sense that we don't explain policies as well as we should. And I think that you really are, are honing this craft. So what is the general response from people who might not necessarily be inclined to support something like single payer off the bat? Well, I feel lucky that I've had been able to have these conversations so many times because trust me, there are there are definitely people in the district who, who don't or agree, agree or didn't agree. And the reality is, if I can get three sentences out, inevitably they say, oh, I hadn't thought of it that way that way or oh I didn't realize that so inevitably I mean I, I I remember this distinctly we had a fundraiser when we could actually go out in public right yeah. um at a, at a small bar called the tiny bar and uh and the the former mayor of Omaha was there he's a democrat he you know he would consider himself a, a pretty moderate democrat and he's a supporter of mine but he's he asked me a question there and he said I don't know about this Medicare for all thing explain it so I did three four sentences and afterwards he came up to me and said, you sold me, you sold wow. me on it. Same thing happened when we, we wrote a two page paper, kind of a Q and A on 
on single payer health care. And we had a, a Republican state senator read it and say, wow, I'd never seen it broken down like this. I, I don't know how I couldn't support something like this now. So I, I think, look, there's been so much misinformation, unfortunately, by both Democrats and Republicans put out there. There's, there's a lot of misinformation being spread on purpose, some of it just because people are running and they want people to be more amenable to their ideas and they think if they're more moderate, then it won't scare people as much. And I, and I understand the fear. It sounds crazy that tomorrow morning, some of us could wake up without health care. Well, except for the 30 million Americans who just lost their health care, right? Um, but like for, for most people who have a job, who have health care, and, and it sounds insane. Well, one, there's a transition program. This isn't an overnight a approach. This, uh, this isn't snap our fingers and get health care. But, but it's, it's rational, it's reasonable, and it makes sense, and it saves money. So I don't see why we wouldn't at least put out this idea, this, you know, and, and see where we go. Like, there's going to be compromise along the way. I, I actually, one of the things I'm concerned about is overutilization. And I talked to Pramila Jayapal, a congressman who introduced the bill. And we talked a little bit about this. And she said, there's places in the bill that prevent that. But I get why people would be worried about that. You know, people worry that people are hypochondriacs and, and are going to use healthcare too much. And then what do we do if we have to wait in lines? I get all that. It's scary. But the reality is we would we're, in the United States of America, we would come up with the system that works and we can do it in a way where we're actually saving money, eliminating waste and giving people freedom to choose their health care provider. I, I kind of want to go back to um, your victory. Part of the reason why I felt um, really frustrated with, you know, the 2020 election is because, you know, COVID-19, it really changed the dynamic of a lot of these congressional races, because I think that, you know, the bread and butter of grassroots candidates is to knock on doors. So you managed to win during a pandemic. Can you explain how COVID-19 changed your race and how you adapted and how that's going to change, you know, the race going forward? Because, you know, as far as we know, this could continue until November. We don't necessarily know how long social distancing and self-quarantine will be, uh, you know, something that is a necessity. So how did you adapt? And going forward, what would you say to other progressives who are currently running campaigns who haven't, you know, um, they haven't won yet and their primaries are coming up? How do you think they can arm themselves to adapt to a pandemic? It's tough. And as I said before, I think the fact that we did have relatively high name ID helped, obviously. Um, but we we were able, I have a great team, and they were able to very quickly reconfigure so that rather than knocking on doors, because we stopped you know, immediately once we felt like it was unsafe for either our team or our volunteers or people at the doors. Um, when we stopped door knocking, we immediately switched to phone banking. And, and there were days where we were making, you know, we had one weekend where we made 30,000 phone calls to people in the district. And wow. there's the technology out there to do that. And if you have a strong volunteer base, you can make that many calls. But it's really a, a relying on that grassroots support. And I think that's the nice thing for most progressives. They have that support already. So they can just really mobilize their own people and come up with some creative solutions. We did a program called Kids for Cara where we delivered little coloring sheets in bags with crayons and stickers to kids. We had about a hundred people request these bags around the district on TV and mail. But I think you also have to look at other ways of reaching people and certainly the phone, especially when the pandemic hit was the best way because people were home and answering their phones. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um I wanted to ask you about the current fight that's being waged in Congress. Uh, we saw Pramila Jayapal really speak out because Nancy Pelosi didn't include her provision to uh, guarantee paychecks to workers that she fought for. And after a large portion of the agenda of the Con Congressional Progressive Caucus wasn't included in the HEROES Act, and most progressives voted for it anyway, I wanted to ask what your position would have been. You know, as a member of Congress, would you have still voted for the HEROES Act? Or would you have, you know, taken the Jayapal stance and not voted for it? Because, you know, I, I get the conflict internally. You know, there's some good in that bill, but at the same time, a lot of the progressive agenda was left off. It still doesn't go far enough. So how, you know, if you're going to affect change from within, how do you effectively challenge leadership and even not necessarily challenge, but how do you get them to take the progressive agenda seriously? Because one of my main criticisms lately ha has been of members of Congress who are progressive that don't actually challenge leadership in a really effective and meaningful way. And I think that if they held strong as a block and withheld votes once in a while, they would actually be more successful at, 
you know, just being taken seriously by, you know, members of Democratic Party leadership. So what's your stance on this whole battle with the Heroes Act? Would you have supported it? What do you think would have been the better strategy to get more progressive provisions included in the Heroes Act? Well, so so to answer your question, I, I would have supported it and, and, and mostly because in our district, there are so many people who have reached out to us because they're not getting what they need from their current congressperson who voted against it, by the way, and um, who are, are struggling and, and struggling pretty hardcore. And, and there are provisions here that will help. So, um, but, but as to your broader question, I mean, one of the things we need to do is to get different, more progressive candidates into Congress, right? Because as we expand, that base as we make sure that there's more of a block of, of progressive leaders in Congress, people who are willing to work across the aisle, people who are willing to challenge leadership, people who are willing to get things done. Um, this is where we, we, we just need more people who are running on these platforms to get into Congress. And then I think that's where the negotiation starts too, right? Like we, this is this is a relatively new movement that we're seeing in Congress. 2018 was had some bright, shiny spots. We need a lot more of that to get things done. At what point do progressives in Congress actually really make a difference on the larger Democratic Party agenda? Because currently, you know, Nancy Pelosi won't allow a vote on Medicare for all, even though, you know, we know that it wouldn't pass the Senate. But symbolically, it would, it would make a difference and show voters that, you know, the Democrats just delivered on Medicare for all. They voted for it. So elect a Democrat or more Democrats and uh, you get Medicare for all delivered to you. Like, what do you think progressives can do? Because currently, I don't really see the strategy um, from members of the Congressional Progressive Congress uh, Caucus being utilized correctly? Like, I, I look to the Freedom Caucus. I disagree with them on everything, but you can't deny that they were effective and they really hammered leadership. So in, in terms of like going into Congress, this is difficult because you're not, you're not there yet. And, you know, you, you don't, you know, it, it'll be awkward, right? Because you don't necessarily want to challenge your own colleagues, your boss and Nancy Pelosi. That's so tough. So I, I can only imagine what that's like. But what will your strategy be to really elevate the progressive agenda, given the fact that in terms of numbers, you know, you don't have that much progressives, given the fact that, you know, you are taking on, you know, special interests. What will you do to basically make sure that what we want as, you know, the left, center left actually is going to get more of a... Um, more of a standing in Congress, if not passed altogether. Sure. Well, well, first of all, my boss will always be the constituents in my district. That's a good answer. And and so I I truly believe that people here deserve a voice. And and so I'm going to listen to them. Now, we're a swing district. And I think when you have candidates that say, like, I'm going to listen to everybody and do what everybody wants, that's crazy, right? Yeah. Because, like, um, like, you know, not half the district, but you know, quarter of the district certainly are, don't agree with most of the things that I that I would like to get done. Although they would benefit tremendously from them, so I think the other place where we we need to do this well is is to really pick and choose our battles. And and the 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 tough thing right now is that with the pandemic, there's there's I mean, this is the worst crisis we've seen in the country other than Donald Trump as president <laughs> in a while, uh, if ever. And so. Um, that this is a tough time to be, you know, I, I, I feel for Congresswoman Jayapal, I feel for, you know, some of the co or Congressman Rokana, like, I think that they've been incredible um, attempts to get some more progressive policies implemented. And, and I think we also have to look at wins from a different perspective, right? So, so what, what are the things that we can accomplish? Where are the things where we can get bipartisan support for them? I mean, when we talk about Things, you know, people always ask me like, well, what are the things you can work with Republicans on? Well, infrastructure, certainly something that we all agree on. Um, you know, there we, we all think that pharmaceutical prices are too high. And that was something Donald Trump ran on and we haven't seen any movement. And I guess when I say we all think that I have to go back and say, well, but Congressman Bacon voted against lowering prescription drugs. So most people think that they're too high. So I do think that there's some common ground there. But um, but I think it's also it, it's also going to take different voices, different kinds of messaging. And my background has been in bringing people together to solve problems. When I was hired to start my nonprofit in Omaha, Omaha Healthy Kids Alliance, my board was made up of membership who were you know, appointed by the Nebraska delegation, who were almost all Republicans. And we were able to get a lot of things done. I actually worked with uh, one of our Republican U.S. senators years ago to help 
sponsor the Healthy Housing Council Act. He was the only Republican in the Senate that would even touch it. And it's to create a council to advise over healthy housing issues. It's not like some sort of radical thing, but like, but that's the work that I've done. So I believe I will take, I can take that experience and expertise to Congress to try to get some stuff done. That's great. That's encouraging to hear. Um, one last thing I want to ask you with regard to policy is in a perfect world, um, if you could pass whatever you wanted to with regard to COVID relief, what policies uh, would you implement? What do you think your constituents would need the most at this time immediately? Um, well, I, you know, and I, I think that the way that the it began and that and is ending is like it needs to be flipped, right? So it's always got to be working people first, workers first. Um, what are we doing for them? Bailing out the big corporations? Yeah, we can get to that, but like they're doing fine, right? Um, so, so starting there, starting with small businesses. I've talked to so many small business owners who are just don't know what they're going to do next. And when you have the president of the United States say things like small businesses will be fine, but maybe under new ownership. It's like, come on, dude, you don't yeah. like, you must understand on, on some level that these are family owned businesses that have been passed down for generations sometimes. And the idea that you would just completely disrespect that is so un-American to me. So it's like, we really have to start looking at this from a different perspective. So for me, that's where we would have started. Yeah, yeah. The response has been completely tone deaf. You know, there was a there was a moment in time where at the beginning of this pandemic, it kind of seemed like maybe we would see some bipartisanship in, in terms of relief. But, you know, that hope dissipated almost immediately when we, we just didn't get that. You know, a one time payment of twelve hundred dollars is obviously not enough for working families and you know when they you know give us those crumbs give working people those crumbs but it's tied to a huge multi-trillion dollar bailout for special interests you know it, it just shows why we need people like you in congress because this can't keep continuing we can't keep giving you know um special interests all of these gifts for lack of a better word while the working people continue to struggle. And, you know, the the sense that I get from, you know, members of Congress and President Trump is that they don't even really seem to care anymore. Like the, the belief is that, you know, workers got that $1,200 bailout. That's fine. You know, I think it was Steve Mnuchin who implied that it could last uh, 10 weeks or something to that effect. I'm paraphrasing. So it's just it's ridiculous. So, look, I, I think that anybody who's watching this is incredibly excited about your campaign and we want to see you win. So give us your um, information about what we can do. If we don't leave, live in your district, how can we affect change and get you elected? What can we do for you? Because we all want to see you in Congress. We know you'd be a fighter. How do we make that happen? Um, so if everybody watching could move to the district, <laughs> I think that would be really helpful. And then, um, <laughs> uh, you know, I, we we rely heavily on volunteers, as I said before. So we, we do have opportunities for people to sign up on our website, eastmanforcongress.com. I don't take corporate PAC money, so we also rely on grassroots donations and um, any amount is great. We have a, a program called Invest Her. That's a peer-to-peer -peer fundraising program. So you can sign up and you know set a goal for yourself. I want to get 20 people to donate, or I'm going to raise 50 bucks, or whatever it is. Um, we want to grow our grassroots support as much as possible. And then just spreading the word, commenting on our stuff on social media, letting people know that you know on our team that that, that you're with us. It's nice to feel this collective energy right now of people who actually want to change the country and move it in the right direction. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. And I will make my pitch for Kara. Um, even if you don't necessarily live in that district, the policies that she passes will be implemented nationally. Like I always like to point the, to the example of Ilhan Omar to where she proposed student debt cancellation that impacts me directly. And she's not my representative. So, you know, th this is about building, you know, a nationwide movement. And we do this in every single district and get, you know, as many progressives elected as we possibly can. So, Kara, thank you so much for uh, winning, first of all, and giving us kind of something to fight for and letting us know that a victory is possible, even in very weird circumstances with, you know, a, a pandemic and whatnot. And yeah, we'll be we'll be rooting for you and watching this race closely. If I don't have you back on before the election, hopefully I can bring you on when you're actually a member of Congress. That will be uh, very exciting. That would be great. I'm happy to come on anytime. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kara. Kara Eastman running in Nebraska's second congressional district against Republican Don Bacon. Uh, links will be in the description box if you would like to donate and support her campaign.